Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another in our series of online programs. My name is Patrice Weaver with the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust. The Commission is a secular, nonpartisan state agency that strives to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and promote public understanding of the history. Today, we're going to look at an event that occurred on November 9th and 10th in 1938 in Nazi Germany. This has come to be known as Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass. I will now turn the program over to Sally Levine. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome. I hope everybody is well. I know this has been um, quite a roller coaster of a time over the past few weeks, um, but we hope that you are all well and we miss you terribly and hope that it's not gonna be that much longer before we'll be able to be together in person again. This morning, I'm gonna do a presentation on Kristallnacht. Um, and Kristallnacht, as you probably all know, occurred on November 9th and 10th of 1938. So 82 years ago, on November 9th and 10th, 1938, a coordinated campaign of terror was unleashed against the Jews of Germany and Austria. What was the pretext for this seminal event? This, okay. Herschel Greenspan, 17 years old, had left his family in Germany and moved to Paris in 1936. In October of 1938, German authorities expelled from the Reich thousands of Jews of Polish citizenship who were living in Germany. Greenspan received news that his own parents, who were residents in Germany since 1911, were among them. Greenspan's parents and the other expelled Polish Jews were initially denied entry into their native Poland. They found themselves stranded in a refugee camp in the border region between Poland and Germany. Conditions there were desperate. In testimony he gave after the Holocaust, Herschel Greenspan's father said the following, and these are excerpts. On the 27th of October, 1938, it was a Thursday night at eight o'clock. A policeman came to our home and told us to come to region two. We were taken to a concert hall and there, there were about 600 people to start. There we stayed until Friday night. It was about 24 hours. More and more people were brought there from many other places. Then they took us in police trucks, about 20 men in each truck, and they took us to the railway station. The streets were black with people shouting at us, the Jews out to Palestine. After that, they took us by train to the German-Polish border. Together by then, we were about 12,000 people. When we reached the Polish border, we were searched to see if anybody had any money and anyone who had more than 10 marks, the balance was taken from him. Then we walked two kilometers on foot to the Polish border. They told us to go on ahead. The SS men were whipping us. Those who lingered, they hit and blood was flowing on the road. They treated us in a most barbaric fashion. They shouted at us, run, run. I myself received a blow and I fell into a ditch. When we got to the open border, they took us to a village of about 6,000 people. And here we were, 12,000. The rain was driving hard. People were fainting. Some suffered heart attacks. On all sides, we saw old men and women. Our suffering was great. There was no food. Since Thursday, we had not wanted to eat any German bread. And that's the end of the quotes. Zindel Grinspan, Herschel's father, also recalled that the Jews were put in stables that were still dirty with horse manure. A truck with bread finally did arrive, but there was not enough bread to go around. And here our story moves forward. Zindel Grinspan sent a postcard to his son Herschel in Paris, describing the horrors that the family had experienced. Already living illegally in Paris, 
Herschel Greenspan apparently sought revenge for his family's dire circumstances. He showed up at the German embassy and shot point blank the diplomatic official to whom he had been introduced. That victim was Ernst von Roth, a low level Nazi functionary. Von Roth died on November 9th, 1938, two days after the shooting. That date was also the anniversary of the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, which was an important date in the Nazi calendar. The party leadership assembled in Munich for the observance of both the anniversary and the funeral of von Roth. They then used the occasion as a pretext to launch a night of looting, vandalism, violence, and murder against the Jewish populations under their control. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels suggested at the event that, quote, world Jewry had conspired to commit the assassination. He and other Nazi officials then set the wheels in motion for Kristallnacht. Let me just move this so you can see. Okay. Goebbels announced that the Fuhrer has decided that demonstrations should not be prepared or organized by the party, but insofar as they erupt spontaneously, they are not to be hampered. If we go back, note the Kristallnacht order, okay, which gave directives actually for this spontaneous demonstration. Thousands of synagogues, shops, and homes were vandalized or destroyed. Almost 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. And I'm just going to show you some images from Kristallnacht. Notice the children and people standing and looking at the camera. Again, a crowd. Again, a crowd. A crowd. And here we see the 30,000 Jewish men, some of whom were arrested in Baden-Baden and then at Buchenwald. Now, sometimes individual stories help us to understand larger historical events. So today we're going to explore the story of Fred Bachner and his family and the story is the last bar mitzvah before Kristallnacht. The rabbi's ominous sermon on his, on his big day carried Fred through the pogrom, the camps and liberation. And the quote is, and you'll hear it again, it doesn't become daytime before it literally becomes night. So Fred Bachner was born on September 28, 1925, Yom Kippur, to a Jewish family in the German capital. At that time, Berlin's Jewish community was large, approximately 170,000 people by 1933. And the city was the seat of most of Germany's national Jewish organizations. Fred's family at the time owned a successful clothing factory and Fred attended a public school in Berlin. By the time of Fred's bar mitzvah in Berlin, Hitler had been in power for five years. It was October 1938, and Jews were prohibited in nearly all from participating in nearly all facets of German life. Anti-Semitism was part of life for Germany's Jews by then. In 1935, 10-year-old Freddie was stripped of his German citizenship, and as a Jew was then prohibited from going to public school. He then went to school, a Jewish school, at the Reichstrasse Synagogue. The Bachner family desperately wanted to leave Germany, but their attempts to get visas were unsuccessful, as you know many people's efforts were. But as bad as things were, they could not have imagined that only a few weeks after their son's bar mitzvah, synagogues throughout Austria and Germany would be destroyed on Kristallnacht, and one of those included the Reichstrasse Synagogue, where Fred's bar mitzvah was celebrated. 
Fred's bar mitzvah would be the last held at the Reichstrasse synagogue for many years. For his bar mitzvah, Fred's Torah portion was Hazinu, which he read as a small group of friends and family still in Berlin looked on. Hazinu is the Hebrew word for listen. Fred Bachner distinctly remembered listening to the rabbi's foreboding words to the congregation, warning them that things were going to get a lot worse before they got better. The rabbi said, and here it is again, it doesn't become daytime before it literally becomes night. So as the Bachners posed for the family portrait, which you see here at Fred's bar mitzvah, they did not know that this would be their last photo taken as a family. In the days and weeks immediately after Fred's bar mitzvah, nighttime was beginning to fall. The situation escalated dramatically on October 28th when Jews of Polish citizenship, as we know, living in Germany, including Fred's father, were arrested and forced across the border into Poland. Now let's listen to Fred Bachner describe this in his own words. We took everything into a suitcase and we grabbed the baby carriage and put it on top of the baby carriage. And our family, we started to hold ourselves together and started to march to evacuate uh, further in, in, into Poland. Now, I don't remember exactly how many kilometers we marched or so, but it was, uh, I don't know, it was about, we managed in, in four days and five days to go about uh, 100 kilometers or maybe 70 kilometers. And we walked across the fields, you know, because the uh, corn was already uh, taken in and the hay and the potatoes, were the, only the potatoes were still out in the field because this is a very big farm country, Poland. So um, we started to go further and we, we walked further and who do we meet there? The German soldiers because they got ahead of us, not not by on the on the roads, but they were par parachuting in to the to the advanced areas and securing the advanced areas. And when we came, you know, they, we come there, we see the German soldiers, and they said, oh, "Go back home, go back home. That's all you, wherever you, whatever city you are from, go back home." And right there and then, they started the big anti-Semitism by the soldiers. To, to see the, the Jewish, the religious Jewish people used to have beards and uh, the big pies, you know. And, and you, you wouldn't believe it, but they started literally to rip out the beard and rip out the thing, you know. And uh, so the, the Jews, you know, they, they started to, to take a bandage around the, the, uh, the chin and hide the hair from the beard in there. And when German came, you know, they had, they had the toothache or headache or whatever it was, you know, to, to save themselves with the beards. And here are some photographs you've probably seen before. Um, on the left, you see a Jewish man who is being forced to cut the beard of another, and this is in Poland. Um, September or October 1939. And again, look at the crowds behind. You know, we often talk about the targets, we talk about the perpetrators, but look at the people standing by. And then, of course, another situation where a beard was being cut off on the right. And then, Kristallnacht. Now, Freddie and his mother were still in Berlin after his father had been sent out. That particular video that you saw was shortly after Kristallnacht. The Night of Broken Glass took place on November 9th and 10th, 1938. It was a violent, destructive, and coordinated attack on Jewish homes and shops and synagogues. Kristallnacht was a turning point for Jews throughout Austria and Germany. Darkness indeed continued to fall. 
Freddie and his mother were now alone in Berlin and concerned about the future would bring. And after several months, they were given permission to join Freddie's father in his hometown in Poland, which as it turned out was only 10 kilometers from Auschwitz, later known as Auschwitz. In February, 1943, the family was rounded up by the Nazis for deportation. Freddie's father was sent to a series of concentration camps. His mother was deported to Auschwitz where she was sent directly to the gas chamber. And after being sent to a series of work camps on September 30th, 1944, Freddie arrived at Auschwitz. Around that day, only six years earlier, Freddie had read his Torah portion at his bar mitzvah in the Reichstrasse synagogue. Now he stood at the gates of Auschwitz awaiting his fate. Freddie Bachner spent the Holocaust in five concentration camps. He survived Auschwitz, a death march, Grossrosen, and Dachau. And here are some documents that we found from the Erelson archives, and I'll just stop for a moment to talk about this. Documents like these are available to everyone who is researching the Holocaust. Um, if you go on to the arlsonarchives.com and you put in the name of a particular person, if they were in any of the Nazi camps, you will find documentation of that available on that website. So that is now public and it is available. Some of you may remember this from about five or six years ago. It used to be called the International Tracing Service. That was before all of it was digitized and put online. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Here are some more documents. Fred was reunited with his father and his brother after the Holocaust. He immigrated to the United States with them in 1947. And here are some of his documents. So this is a US Army document, okay? And this one is his identity card, and this was from 1946. Fred Bachner married and raised a family in New York where religion was an integral part of his life. Every year, he would chant his Haftorah as he did at his bar mitzvah. And each Yom Kippur, which was also his birthday, he would lead the afternoon services. He said that he did these things as a testament that both he and Jewish life had survived. Fred Bachner's participation in religious services brought back fond memories of his childhood and connected him with his youth. It also connected him with the Reichstrasse synagogue. Fred Bachner passed away in 2008 the last time he was at the Reichstrasse synagogue was the morning after Kristallnacht, when it had been vandalized, its Torah scrolls and books set on fire. He did not live to see the synagogue of his youth restored. His daughter sees this as a metaphor for Fred's life, that the destruction carried on even after the Holocaust and that even though people were able to put lives together for themselves, the damage that had been done to them, the destruction to their lives before the Holocaust was never ever repaired. And so these are superficial repairs. She said that the numbers on their arms were there and were imprinted upon them and their families forever. Today, this is what the Reichstrasse synagogues looks like from the interior. You can see how magnificent it is, and you can imagine how magnificent it was for Jews living in Germany before the Holocaust. It's so important to understand what was lost, and this gives us a pretty good picture of what that is. Also on Kristallnacht, there were many other individuals and families that were gravely impacted. So here are some of our survivors from Atlanta, most of blessed memory. 
Um, fortunately, we still have Henry Burberry with us. Um, he is still living in Atlanta and still telling his story. We have Bert Lewin. We have John Silva, Stephen Lowe. It's hard to see, but Francis Bunzel is upper right. And then we have um, Alice Scher and Ben Hirsch and Herbert Cohn. And now I'm, I'm gonna blank out on the, the people who are here. Frank and Helen Spiegel. The, yes, the Spiegels, thank you so much. And then the last one is, is of Mr. Marks who we honored just a couple of years ago. So we are so quickly losing all of these special people, but all of them and their families were impacted by the Holocaust. And we were fortunate to have them here. We are fortunate to have Henry Burnbury with us and we miss them terribly. And I'll conclude by saying, many historians view those two days of mob violence as the onset of the Holocaust, the attempt by Nazi Germany to annihilate all of the Jews. What is interesting to note is that after Kristallnacht, larger and larger numbers of German Jews and Austrian Jews were able to come to the United States and escape what would have been certain death. So the, so the Holocaust and Kristallnacht are both very important topics for us to study, but to understand Kristallnacht, to understand that this was widespread government-sponsored violence and that the people of Germany and of Austria did not react, did not respond. And that let the Nazis know that they could get away, literally, with murder. We are now at the end of today's program. Thank you for watching. And as ever, if you have questions about today's presentation, please email me at patriceweaver at holocaust.georgia.gov. Thank you very much.